Vanillaware has always been a studio in my periphery, a fact I mentioned in my review of 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. Their unique art style and signature genre blending has always made them an interesting studio to follow, dating all the way back to their first release under the Vanillaware banner, Grim Grimoire. This time, they've set their sights back on their roots and right on my heart with Unicorn Overlord, a real-time tactics role-playing game that pays tribute to the genre's golden age. So, does Unicorn Overlord deliver? What surprises does Vanillaware have in store? And does it run comparably well on Nintendo Switch versus PlayStation 5? Let's find out. But first, please subscribe, click the bell, and stay tuned at the end and to the video cards for more content. Now, let's start a revolution. This review is based on physical retail releases for PlayStation 5 and Nintendo Switch. Unicorn Overlord's narrative is cut from the same fantasy cloth as its genre forerunners. The Kingdom of Cornea is betrayed by its general Valmor, and Cornea's queen mounts a heroic last stand. This allows her son Elaine and his protector Joseph enough time to escape. Backed by the invading land of Zenoira, Valmor defeats the queen, conquers all the lands of Fevrith, and is crowned the Emperor, whereupon he adopts a new name, Galerius. Ten years later, the deposed Prince Elaine strikes out to reclaim his birthright from the man that felled his kingdom. This story is classic fantasy. Royal bloodlines, political schemes, coup d'etat, and a rebel faction led by the uncrowned prince cornered by his kingmaker. More than just taking a page from the genre's rich history, the chronicles of Fevrith are ensconced in the medium's tropes, cliches, and cornerstones. Unicorn Overlord reads like the next generation of the classic tales it evokes, and I am all the more enamored by it. No beating around the bush, Unicorn Overlord is visually stunning. That trademark Vanillaware art is on full display here. On PS5, the game runs at 2160p, 60 frames per second. That's pretty standard, and I am thoroughly satisfied with my experience on PlayStation. Here's the twist. Performance on Nintendo Switch is an impressive 1080p 60 docked and 720p 60 handheld. That's right, the game runs at a smooth 60 frames per second on Switch with basically zero problems throughout, meaning the resolution alone is the main sacrifice this time around. Here's a split-screen comparison if you'd like that. Here's a side-by-side. And here's a screen wipe, starting with undocked Nintendo Switch. Now on the TV. And finally, PlayStation. Any way you slice it, Unicorn Overlord is a beautiful game. Not only could you do worse than this, you'd be hard-pressed to find something that looks better in this graphical style, especially on Nintendo Switch. The music is excellent, as per the usual for Vanillaware. I don't know if I'll be humming any of these tunes in my day-to-day -day life the way I do for long-running series, but I really liked everything I heard. And the voice acting is solid as well. Again, nothing really stood out to me one way or the other, and I opted to play in English because the game has an obviously European aesthetic. I beg you, my queen, take leave of this place while you're still able. To where, I might ask? My every last of Cornea's lords has forsaken us in favor of the traitor Valmor. No refuge remains for a crowned fugitive. Yet the general seeks my death, and mine alone. I shall not flee from that fate. Both audio options are quite good, however, and I did enjoy the time I spent with the Japanese voice acting. Yatsu 
But out of all its compelling factors, I think Unicorn Overlord's gameplay is the most interesting. Combat is a tactical RPG, not in the turn-based ways of Tactics Ogre, but rather in the real-time tactical route of Ogre Battle. This style of gameplay is always hit or miss on a person-to-person -person basis, and if you already do not like tactical RPGs, this game is not for you. That being said, if you're like me, this game is exemplary. The core gameplay is simple enough. Deploy units from your forts to defeat enemies, liberate towns, and capture enemy bases. Each battle has a loss condition, usually the fall of the main liberation fort, and a win condition, typically the defeat of the enemy commander. But of course, there's so much more. Let's start at the beginning. Party members are sorted into different character classes that each have their own unique skills and applications, some innate and some applied via their gear. The player then creates combat units composed of two or more party members. Each class has its pros and cons, as seen in most tactical RPGs, so there is no one ultimately powerful unit combination, and picking compatible party members with proper formation is the cornerstone of combat. Traversal speed and movement type are chosen by the unit leader, and unique actions are shared within the unit. These features become more important as the game wears on. Combat is automated, so you have no control during the fights themselves. Instead, characters use active points, or AP, represented by red diamonds. These are proactive skills, including attacks and healing. Passive points, or PP, are the blue diamonds, used for ancillary conditional functions like buffing before an attack, evading an incoming strike, and more. Battles continue until either one unit is defeated, or until all AP and PP is exhausted. In the latter case, the unit with more remaining HP wins. In the real-time segments of battle stages, units have stamina that determines how many actions they can take before needing to rest. Defeating enemies and liberating towns earns the player Valor and eventually Valor Points. Valor Points are used for things like deploying more units and performing Valor Skills. Think of Valor Skills as being in the same vein as Brave Orders from The Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel. There are a wide variety of Valor Skill effects, but I found the most use in the passive Valor Skills. Things like increasing experience gained in the next battle, issuing temporary buffs, or afflicting enemy units with overworld status effects saw the most use in my time with the Liberation. However, be warned that some enemy units can also leverage Valor skills against you in turn. Between combat instances, players can set up tactics for each character. These tactics are, no joke, just an updated form of Final Fantasy XII gambits. Choose your actions, set your primary condition for activation, and a secondary condition if desired, and even sort the behaviors by priority. It is, in form and function, a slightly more advanced gambit system, and I love it. These player-controlled tactics are where the majority of the advanced strategy comes into play, and I spent a decent chunk of time organizing and reorganizing tactics over the course of the campaign. Characters that battle in the same unit will improve their rapport, and hitting certain rapport thresholds unlocks rapport conversations. Rapport is also a feature lifted straight out of another series, this time taking its identity from Fire Emblem supports, and it works just as well here as it did there. After winning a battle stage, the player receives awards and accolades, including money, honors, and renown. Renown unlocks more features for the player to use. Things like the ability to increase the number of units or the number of characters in a unit are granted with increased renown. Honors are used for the actual unlocking of those features, as well as hiring mercenaries. I wasn't expecting to spend much time with the mercenary hires, but there's a surprising amount of customization there as well. You can choose a name, up to two different stat progression archetypes, and general physical design choices for your mercenary. It's not only a neat feature, as this also grants a layer of player investment in the mercs they hire. You're also free to explore the overworld, which made me very happy to see. There are towns to visit, side quests to complete, items to find, and deliveries to make. If a town receives enough deliveries, the residents will be able to rebuild and unlock more features for the player to enjoy. Once you're done in your liberated areas, you move on to the adjacent landscape and continue your journey. Okay. I know that was a lot, and as a strategy game, that's the point. But in its simplest form, Unicorn Overlord's typical gameplay loop involves finding a subjugated area, defeating the encampment of enemies, recruiting a new party member if possible, and then exploring the newly liberated territory. While the depth of gameplay may be daunting to hear explained, and even more daunting to initially experience, 
it flows so smoothly and fluently in practice. It's really easy to sit down, do a few things, look at the clock in real life, and notice several hours have passed. Playing this game is simply a joy. Unicorn Overlord is a spectacular paragon of the tactics RPG genre. Masterful gameplay in both scope and depth, with gorgeous art, lovely music, and strong narrative roots, this is one of the finest RPGs of the modern era, let alone amongst the tactics subgenre. And you know you've done well when Yasumi Matsuno, the creator of the entire tactics genre, gives his personal stamp of approval and recommendation. Arguably the best part, though, is that performance is impressive across the board, and there are very few sacrifices for Nintendo Switch players. If you want trophies in 4K resolution, the PlayStation version is your go-to. If you value portability and don't care about achievements, then the Nintendo Switch version is excellent. And, just to solidify how smitten I am with this game, here's my Platinum Trophy. So I know I've done this twice this year already, and I'm not trying to be provocative when I say this. Unicorn Overlord on PlayStation 5 and Nintendo Switch is a masterpiece, and it earns a 10 out of 10. Please subscribe, click the bell, and check out the videos on screen. Mite kurete, arigatou gozaimasu. Minasan, gokigen yo, sayonara.